Well, do keep your Bibles open at Daniel chapter 3 or 10 there, or, or maybe look Daniel 3 up again uh, online. I think it'd be helpful as we just spend a, a bit of time now looking um, at that bit of the book together. But before we do that, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come uh, before your word now to learn from it. We thank you that you speak to us and we thank you for this wonderful book of Daniel 3. We pray your Holy Spirit would help us to understand whoever we are, whatever background we're coming from, wherever we are at uh, in our thinking about you, Father. We pray that uh, we would encounter you, the living God of the whole earth. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, knowing the difference between the real deal and the fake deal can be really, really important. Growing up uh, as children in my house that I grew up in, um, we would often not really have Coca-Cola, the real deal, if you like. Uh, most often we'd have the cheaper version from the supermarket. But very occasionally, on special occasions, maybe at parties or celebrations, we would be allowed to taste the real deal Coca-Cola. And when we did, of course, we really did know about it. We loved it. Now, Coca-Cola isn't really life or death, but knowing the difference between a piece of string or a proper climbing rope if you're climbing up a cliff, now that really does matter. But potentially what matters even more is what we find out about in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, as we look at Daniel 3, uh, together now, uh, we're going to learn about the real deal of life, the Coca-Cola of life, if you like. What is the real deal when it comes to our priorities, when it comes to our purpose, when it comes to our prayers? So first, what I want to do this morning is just uh, show us uh, from Daniel chapter 3, firstly, what is the fake deal of life? And then show us what is the real deal of of life from these verses. So do follow along with me. Firstly, as we look at the fake deal, which we're told is the man-made God in verses 1 to 15. Let's look at the design argument then as we look at verse 1. It says this, doesn't it? King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high, 60 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. So King Nebuchadnezzar, we see, builds this huge statue. I want you to imagine this statue with me. Okay, so it said uh, uh, 60 cubits high, 60 cubits wide. Well, that means it's 27 metres high and about 3 metres wide. So this is a really skinny, odd-looking statue. And it's made from top to bottom in pure Gold. Can you imagine being stood there and just looking up and seeing this tall, skinny statue in pure gold? There's just one problem with this statue for King Nebuchadnezzar. It's designed for worship. It's designed to be worshipped. But it's man-made. You see, it's fantastic to look at, but it's completely flawed as something to praise. It's just like the things that we often love the most, isn't it? You know, children, if, if you're listening, uh, think about your favourite toy. Just think about that for a moment. The thing that you'd be so annoyed about if you lost. You couldn't imagine losing it. Can you think of that? Now, maybe for the older people among us, it might be our car that we just, it's just precious. We just need it. It might be our computers these days. Uh, in the lockdown. It might be our holiday or for some of us it might be our Xbox or our swanky house that we keep doing up. Whatever it is, um, there's a strong temptation in it to make these things, these, these objects, the focus of our life and of our worship. We make these things our priority, our purpose and, and even sometimes we make them the object of our ultimate praise. Now all of those things they don't feel anywhere near as odd, do they, as worshipping a 27 metre golden statue. But when we consider the true eternal creator who made everything, that is the God who, who made the whole earth and made everything in it, it puts all of those temporary created things into perspective, doesn't it? When we compare those created things, however precious they are to us, however important, however great they are, and they are great things many, many, most of the time, but in comparison, they're put into perspective. You see, these things are to be enjoyed, don't get me wrong, but they're not to be worshipped. Picture this statue with me again, though. Uh, go back there to that statue. You're standing there with King Nebuchadnezzar. 
And notice that it's pure gold all the way through. Now in Daniel chapter 2, that's the chapter uh, before Daniel 3, <laughs> the statue Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, he had, he had a dream of this statue. And in that dream, he, he dreamed of a statue that was representing uh, different kingdoms. And at the head, there was this golden head that represented the kingdom of Babylon. The golden head at the top was Babylon. But notice that this statue isn't just a golden head, but it's gold all the way through. And so this statue it seems to be representing what Nebuchadnezzar thought was his kingdom of all kingdoms. This is his kingdom. This is the kingdom of Babylon and it is the kingdom of uh, kingdoms. It's not just the one at the top that's going to die out. It's the kingdom that is golden all the way through. It's top dog. And here's the scary thing that I want you to really see. What's going on here? Ultimately, while Nebuchadnezzar builds this statue and calls people to worship, Who's actually in control? Who's in control? It's himself, isn't it? It's a completely man-made religion ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar. In some sense, he's made himself God because he sets the rules. He calls people to worship. He is the one in charge. So given this weird looking statue, this 27 metre golden statue, how is he going to convince the people of his kingdom to worship this image. Well, he needs to use the art of persuasion really well, doesn't he, in verse two and three. You see, Babylon is now a diverse kingdom. It's much more like London than Scarborough. Now, I'll tell you now, at Trinity Church Scarborough, we are so blessed to be an di increasingly diverse church, ethnically, uh, in all kinds of ways. We, we love it, and it's growing, and it's great. Um, but, but, but London is, is a different place, isn't it? London um, is much more uh, diverse and, and that's a bit more of a feel about what um, Babylon would have been like. Look with me at verse 2 and 3. Here's what he does in this diverse place. He summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates and all the other provi provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and they stood before it. What does he do? How does he get this diverse group of people to come and worship this Im image? Well, he starts with the leaders, doesn't he? He brings the celebrities, the high flyers, on board as an example. He gets all the big names off TV to come down. As if to say, to be honest, if you want to make it as a star on TV or the radio or anywhere, as a YouTuber maybe, that's the thing to do these days, you better bow down to this statue like the rest. If you're going to make it in my society, you better follow the rules. You better follow the rules of my uh, political correctness. You better follow the rules of my religion and my culture, says King Nebuchadnezzar, if you want to make it. And so what do people start doing? Well, you can imagine. People start thinking, if this is for the biggest, the brightest and the best, then it's got to be for me, right? I've got to start worshipping the statue. Children, you think about it. We often want to wear the clothes, don't we, that our coolest friends wear. We look around and go, well, they're, they're doing it, aren't they? So I think think I might as well. It's the same here. There's a way to make something that seems ridiculous to one generation become very normal for the next. But in case of any doubters, there might be some doubters in this Babylonian society about this worship of this statue. King Nebuchadnezzar, don't just use the art of persuasion, uh, but he has another weapon. And so he gets his propaganda minister, his herald, to make an announcement. Uh, let's see what this weapon of fear is in verses 4 to 7. See, there's, there's two main ways that you can convince people to do what you want them to do. Either you win their hearts, you win their love, or you win their fear. So at school, uh, it is always better, and if you remember back to those days or if you're there now, it's always better for your friend to join in your game because they love you and because they love the game. It's much better that way, isn't it, than saying join in with my game otherwise I'm going to punch you in the face. That's not a good way, is it? Join in because you love my game and because you love me. Here's the King Nebuchadnezzar's problem. He's going to struggle to win everyone's love and win everyone's heart because of his track record, because of who he is. So he has to use fear and threats. 
And that's what he does. When his royal orchestra plays, everyone must fall down in worship. However, verse 6, look with me. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Can you imagine? Now, thankfully, our government are not asking us to worship man-made gods like Nebuchadnezzar's. However, in World War II, the Nazis did really actually try and influence the German church and change how they worshipped and who they worshipped. They wanted to control how, what people believed and how they behaved. They really did. And many people and many pastors refused because they prioritised God, the living God, the God they believed in, the God who created everything. And so often uh, these pastors and these people were taken to terrible conditions in prison camps and because of that. Now we don't have it as bad, do we, in this society? But there is still an increasing fear uh, for Christians in society. There's always pressure, isn't there, for Christians to cease to worship God and to replace him with a God made in the image of man. The I like to think of God as kind of idea and maybe a, a God who is not holy and so doesn't hold people accountable for evil he's not going to tell everyone tell anyone off a God who is happy for people to pledge their allegiance to other gods you know I'm the, I'm the, I'm the God who made you but if you want to go and give your first love to anyone else fine go for it a God who loves all the things we love and hates all the things and just so happens to hate all of the things that we hate but of course that's not the God of the Bible and neither was Nebuchadnezzar's statue, neither was his image. So what do people do in this situation? Nebuchadnezzar says, worship this image or else face the flames. What do they do? Well, we find out next, don't we? Some of them became conscientious objectors. Big word, conscientious objectors. See, Nebuchadnezzar's threats to make people worship this golden image really actually worked. And, and here's what some of the people did. Some people told the king in verse 12, look with me at verse 12. There are some Jews uh, whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They pay no attention to you, king, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now, children, maybe on your sheets you could uh, write down these men's names because uh, they've come up again, hasn't they? Daniel's friends, Daniel's mate, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. See, these are the Jews who've been living in Babylon. God has blessed them, these guys. God has protected them. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're facing very serious consequences because they follow God and not King Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible's really clear, you know, with Christians on the issue of who we should obey, which authority, which power we should obey. The Bible says we should obey authority, uh, whether it's your teacher at school, your boss at work, or the police questioning whether your third trip to Sainsbury's or Tesco's or Aldi today is legit. The Bible's also pretty clear as well, though, that we should ultimately submit to the authority of Jesus. And in some circumstances, that will mean, and, and I'm not just talking about when you fancy a particular day of, off work and your boss won't let you just because you wanted to go to the beach uh, or wherever you wanted to go. We're not talking about that. But there is, there is some circumstances when obeying the authority of Jesus will mean challenging other authorities and saying, I have to follow Jesus first, if that means going against your authority. Breaking the rules in some cases is the right thing to do, as we as we heard about a, a, a few minutes ago, as we thought about those pastors in World War II. But it's not just about the authorities, is it? There's another kind of authority. There's kind of those cultural rules, aren't there? The, the pressure to conform to all kinds of pressure, to believe or to behave in ways contrary to God, into, to God's ways. Yet a deep commitment to God meant that these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, were willing to lose respect. They were willing to gain the label Bible basher. They were willing to lose their job, but even more, they were willing to lose their life. Yet the temptation, surely, to cave in would be strong at this point. 
You know, they've been spotted out by Nebuchadnezzar's mates. They've been brought before him. They're hauled in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. And here's what King Nebuchadnezzar says to them. And listen to this. Verse 15. Now, when you hear the sounds of the horn, he's speaking directly to them now. So he's looking at them in the eye. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then listen to what he says next. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? That's a great question, isn't it? That's a brilliant question. And it leads to our second point as we're introduced to the human saving God. The human saving God, verse 16 to 30. Now, I don't know whether if some of our children are listening at this point, uh, if you've got friends that think that they are the best at football, they're the best at dancing, but when it comes to it, they're not really as good as other people. Do you know anyone like that? It's not good being all talk. Growing up, I played rugby um, growing up, and I learned quite quickly playing rugby and doing other sports as well that you can't be all talk. You can't get away in life with being all talk. It doesn't matter how good you say you are. If you don't make the tackle, you don't make the tackle. The proof is in the pudding. If you don't make it, you don't make it. Don't be all talk. Now, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are definitely in that place now. They cannot be all talk. Whatever they say about themselves, whatever they say about their God, it's got to be backed up with action, surely, right? Well, we're introduced then next to the God who can do it. This human saving God, verse 17 to 20. And to be honest, it doesn't seem to start very well if you look at verse 17. They start by saying this, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, they say. I'm, 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 I'm sat here thinking, if? If? Surely that's not the way to start a defence. Not ifs, but pleading with the king. Please don't kill us. Please don't kill us. Making your case, arguing your point. Not if, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace. What are they on about? However, however, they know the power of their God. So for them, this is not the case of if he's powerful enough but if he's willing. They, they believe, they know, they've seen the power of their God. But the question is, is he willing? Listen to verse 18. They say this, but even if he doesn't, even if he does not, we want you to know, if he doesn't rescue us, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They are defiant. They're not doubting God's power, but they have the humility to not decide God's plans for him. <laughs> That's what's going on. They're not saying God can't do it. They just have the humility to go, I, look, he's the creator, he's the boss, and I don't know what he's gonna do. Now there's at least two lessons for us here that I, I just think is really helpful. I think firstly, this is a model for prayer. Um, do you notice, uh, do you notice the, the kind of the faith-filled way they speak? And it's a model for prayer, it's faith-filled because it believes God certainly can do it. But it's also humble because it doesn't demand that God does exactly what we want. And that's a great way to pray. Confident. God, we know you can do it. Please do this. We don't know. That's why we're praying. We don't know what you're going to do. Uh, but we know you can. And that's a great way to pray. But secondly, I think the other lesson here uh, for us that is helpful is it really does challenge us at this point. As they're facing the flames, what we value as most precious what would we give up in order to keep our life? Stuff, convictions, beliefs. Well, these men, notice, were willing to lose their life to keep their God. They were willing to lose their life to keep their relationship with God. And so in the immediate, it leads them towards the fire. And it's at this point in verse 19, if you look there, that Nebuchadnezzar's attitude changes. I mean, I, I, he, he surely doubted at first that these high flyers, these people who've, who've been great for Babylon, who've come in and done great things, he surely doubted that they would be stupid enough not to do what he said. The challenge that these men gave to Nebuchadnezzar's key priority in life, though it brought out the most violent anger, 
Didn't, didn't it? If you show disrespect to a gang leader whose life is built on pride, then expect to face fury. Don't show disrespect. If you accidentally scratch a car that is worshipped by its owner, then, you, then you're going to see a disproportionate anger. You've probably all seen it. Maybe you've been the one giving it. Here's the thing, that Worshipping the God of the Bible is a challenge to any worldview at some point. The incredible thing, though, is that this is the world that God has made. This is the world that God has made. And yet, we in the world are willing to worship pretty much anything else other than the God who made it. Yet just like the parent who shows forgiveness and love and steps down showing that forgiveness and love to unruly children, but you're feeling that at the moment as a parent, this God steps down into this world, not with a stick to beat us, but with grace. Let's just see then, um, as uh, the God who comes down in verse 21 to verse 27. We learned, don't we, that the furnace is heated up seven times hotter than normal. And the soldiers who've been said, go and heat this up seven times hotter than normal. And those soldiers are, 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 are killed. They're, they're unprepared. They've never, they've never done this before. It's never, they've never seen Nebuchadnezzar this angry. They've never heated up the fire this hot. And they die in the intense heat. Yeah, what happens next would have caused doubt in the hardest sceptic. Sceptic. If, 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 you, if you were seeing it. Verse 24 to 25, we read this. Listen in. King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty, certainly. He said, look, look at the fire, look at the fire. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Who is this fourth figure? What is going on? Well, well, given what we've seen in the Old Testament, given what we know about the Old Testament, it could be, it could just be, that this uh, son of the gods is God the Son, the pre-incarnate, that is, that is God the Son before he came to earth, before he took on human flesh. But whatever it is, let me tell you this, it is God to the rescue, isn't it? It is God to the rescue. It's hard for us to imagine this scene, yet God comes to the rescue and protects these three people from certain destruction, from the flames. There's some incredible details we read about this. Nebuchadnezzar calls them out of the fire. He, 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 he's, he's awestruck. He's st he can't believe what's going on. He calls them out and the three come out and the crowd gathers round. Verse 27. They saw that the fire hadn't harmed their bodies, not a hair of their heads was singed, their robes were not scorched, there was no smell of fire on them. God could do it, and God did it. Now for those um, who are more sceptical among us, of course this kind of rescue is possible if God is real. No, we're not saying these things happen every day, but, but there are key points in the history of the, of, of the Bible, um, in the, in the run-up to, to Jesus, the key figure of the Bible, when God does these amazing rescues. They're, they're leading us up to the, to the great rescue. And, and, and it leads me to ask, though, what kind of salvation is it that ultimately, a long time after, Jesus would offer us? Here's the reality. We know that Jesus is powerful to save, as we joyfully look back. We know that he was powerful to save and we know that he was willing to save as he died on the cross. But these details in verse 27 are fascinating, aren't they? And they're so helpful. Uh, there's a really helpful picture for us here. Not a hair singed, not a robe scorched, not the faintest smell of smoke is a picture of what the cross achieves. When Jesus died, he died not just to take some of your sin, not just to take some of the punishment for some evil thoughts, not just to take some bad attitudes upon himself, the punishment for them, but he died for a lifetime of rebellion of each of us against God. 
He paid the price. No more debt to pay. It was a full thing. Jesus pays the full ticket for the heavenly pass that we need. His salvation is full, final and secure and there is not even the smell of sin left on his people because of the cross. He takes it all. That's the point of the gospel. He takes it all. That's the truth of Christianity. That's the heart of the message. Jesus does it. He says, it is finished. He paid the price, not the, sin, not the smell of sin on his people anymore. Trust him. Trust him. He paid it all. It's great news. In an age of uncertainty, in life and in death, there is news that says Jesus has paid the price in full. The rescue is full is not partial, we're not left a little bit bent, we're free from the flames and we praise God for it. Trust in Jesus because ultimately this is the God who calls everyone to worship him. Our final little uh, point here, verse 28 to 30. You see the key difference between the 27 metre high God of Babylon and then the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is obvious isn't it? One is dead and one's and static, and the other is living and active. The three men knew this. Their, their trust, uh, their trust and, and the saving power of God impressed Nebuchadnezzar, at least for a moment, uh, verse 28. Listen in. He said this, praise be. He's, he's seen it, he's awestruck. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. You realise at this point, don't you, that compromise as a Christian to what the world would have us live like and believe and do doesn't make Christianity look cool. It just makes it look powerless, unlike the witness of these three men. Faced with the evidence of the living and active God of the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar does the sem sensible thing, verse 29. He said this, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces, their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Now, sadly, Nebuchadnezzar has not lost his violent edge. But he does recognise the real rescuing God as the one worthy of worship, doesn't he? The real deal, the Coca-Cola of life's praise, of life's purpose, of life's ultimate priorities. Now, I promise you, I'm not going to cut you into pieces. I can, but also my Bible won't let me. And I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to cut you into pieces. My Bible doesn't let me. My Bible doesn't want me to. I don't want to. But I don't want you to consider this. The God of the universe, 2,000 years ago, and years after these events in Daniel chapter 3 came down as the rescuer. Dying and rising from death, he won a final victory for us and gave us the free pass into his kingdom. Why not uh, use this time, maybe these strange times are giving you time to think, but why not use this time to investigate the claims? Read about it, learn about it more if you already know about it, love it more, it is wonderful. But ultimately, worship the God who is the real deal. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the real deal. You're the living God, you're the rescuing God, and we praise you that you sent Jesus to be the one who would rescue us fully and finally as he died there on the cross. We thank you that he's risen, he's alive, he's living, he's active, he's at work through his spirit in the world. Please help us, Father, to trust in him, to worship him and to know him the living God um, of all the earth. Amen.